Um, thank you for being here. Um, we are really here uh, tonight to share information with all of you about the work that we're doing in this, in this initiative, to give you an overview of these global trends that we really feel are impacting um, our cities and our economy, um, and actually start the conversation um, with you all uh, about the future of our economy, of our workforce, and our community. And we really see this as the beginning of that conversation. Um, we obviously have had some public events um, until now. We've had um, some partnerships with the Chamber of Commerce. I see Gigi here um, at their State of the City um, events over the last couple of years to begin to float um, the ideas in this conversation. But this is really, as we enter this home stretch, the beginning of our dialogue with the community on how we will respond, how we'll adapt uh, in a fast-changing future. So this is me, um, and I just, uh, my role here is to just open up um, our presentation tonight. You'll hear from a few of us on the team uh, to introduce you to Santa Monica 2050, give you some context, um, and bring you up to speed on what we've been working on to date. So you'll see in this uh, fun animation here a little bit of a timeline. Obviously, there's a lot of um, words here, but I just kind of want to highlight for you um, a few things. Um, Santa Monica has been uh, a community that has undergone economic transformations uh, before. This is not the first inflection point we've had. Um, over the past 80 years, we have evolved from a, a booming manufacturing town with uh, heavy investments in the aerospace industry uh, to a tourist destination, and now, of course, the epicenter of Silicon Beach. These transitions have not always been smooth or easy. And, uh, you know, particularly in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as we saw um, urban renewal strategies come into place, and obviously the 10 freeway, the development of the Civic Center, um, we saw um, large-scale, um, you know, disruptions and displacement of low-income communities, communities of color in particular. And so I think as we enter this strategy um, and look to the future, we're keeping in mind the need to bring our entire community along and maintain a community that's inclusive and accessible uh, for all of our current and future residents. Uh, but as you can see, really, in the start of the timeline here, you know, after those ups and downs in the early 1980s, we had visionary city leaders, not just in City Hall, but our business leaders, our community leaders, who really came together to reimagine the future of Santa Monica's economy and invest um, really in three pillars, um, office business, retail sales, and tourism. And those three uh, pillars really served the city well over the last 30 to 40 years and enabled us to be the prospering, thriving community that we are. Um, and make the kind of investments um, in our public services, in our streets, in our infrastructure that we have until now. Um, but you know, we now are at a place where all of those things, um, tourism, retail, office, the way we work, technology, are undergoing various degrees of disruption, of change, dislocation. Um, things are changing fast, and we can't just plan and depend on the same pillars and the same forces that we have to date uh, anymore. So in the coming years, um, as we see new industries making their presence felt in, in Southern California. We could see artificial intelligence being used to write screenplays and scripts that could disrupt the entertainment and media industry. Of course, we will certainly see, um, we, we do already, some autonomous vehicles um, that will change the way we commute, uh, change the way we spend our time, change the way we get goods and services, um, and shifts, of course, in consumer pre preferences that will change what our cities look like, how people shop, how people move around our city, and how people work. We don't exactly know what the city of the future is going to look like, but we do know that things are changing fast and that we can't just keep doing the same things in terms of our economic strategy, our economic approach, uh, if we want to maintain uh, our community um, and, and keep it uh, thriving and keep it sustainable for the future. So what we started to do um, over the last couple of years, um, like I said, with some State of the City events, with a public event actually here um, in the, this, this very room a couple of years ago, is to start to bring together ideas, expertise, um, some dialogue on what are the trends that will actually have an impact here in Santa Monica uh, so that we could, we could start to prepare uh, on how do we respond, how do we kind of mitigate the risks and enhance our ability to capitalize on the positive trends um, going forward. And what we did um, starting in uh, the fall of last year, uh, kind of the, the green-blue part of the timeline here, we engaged um, our partners, um, our experts at, at Guidehouse Consulting, to help us um, identify those global trends and analyze and develop some adaptations and solutions that we can all work together on going forward. Um, so where we are now, um, where the star is, we are here, um, is where we're holding a series of community events to actually bring our thoughts, our ideas, our research out into the community, um, to the community at large, and also to the community of experts, um, technology leaders, business leaders um, in our community and in our region. Um, and where this is going to culminate is this spring, um, 
we will actually develop and uh, release our Santa Monica 2050 strategy. And again, we will be bringing uh, the community back together before we finalize the strategy so that you all can be a part of the process of setting our recommendations, prioritizing them, telling us what resonates with you, uh, whether something feels missing or feels off, and we can incorporate that input uh, into our strategy. So what is this all about? Um, the economic sustainability strategy um, that we're developing is really intended, as it says in the top, to prepare Santa Monica to harness these global trends that we're setting, maintain our economic vitality, and improve community well-being so that we can, again, not just, this is not just about, you know, maintaining revenues, um, you know, increasing sales tax or business tax base. This is about keeping Santa Monica uh, an inclusive and thriving and prosperous place. And in the areas where we're falling short um, or already seeing, um, you know, some struggles, some dislocation, some displacement, trying to sort of stem the tide on that and capitalize on, on the fast changing economy. So you see kind of an illustration of, you know, the, the third street of the past, of the present, and potentially of, of the future, and, and maybe really that's already here, um, just to sort of illustrate how things are changing um, and what we are, are really here uh, to study and discuss. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to emphasize is that this will, this will not be and is not intended to be uh, a plan, a document that, you know, is in a pretty binder and then ends up on my shelf or Rick Cole's shelf or Andy's shelf or, um, you know, just kind of in this library. We really want it to be um, a, a set of partnerships, a set of action steps that we can partner with uh, our institutions in Santa Monica, our community, um, to actually um, advance um, these issues. So you see here at the bottom some of the questions that we're trying to address. And just to highlight a couple of them, how can we coordinate our efforts to meet our goals on, on the economy, on sustainability, and on well-being, which are things that you hear um, a lot of, um, of us talk about in the city? How can we continue to encourage innovation, be a place where innovators want to come um, to bring their ideas, bring their energy, things that can transform the way that we live, um, enhance the way that we get around town, or enhance the way that we connect to one another? Um, again, a, a key question at the core is how can we counteract historical inequities and ensure that uh, the, these global trends we're talking about will actually be, be to the benefit of all of our communities, and we're really looking at the risks and opportunities of these different trends. So what is this going to be in the end? Um, as I said, um, this is intended to be an ecosystem strategy, so it's not just about city government or city hall. It's about how do we partner with other agencies, in particular in our own community, um, the school district, the college, the chamber, our other business leaders, our community at large, but also beyond our city borders. We're, we're just 8.3 square miles. The city of Los Angeles, um, our other neighboring cities, uh, the West Side Council of Governments, LA Metro, um, and just the broader business economic um, community at large to actually prepare us uh, both as a city and as a region to harness these global trends. It's about an operating model. Really, uh, we think of this as kind of a toolkit for the future. Um, how do we adapt to new things, to disruption, to innovations? I think we all know that you know we saw on our own streets and sidewalks the transportation revolution play out uh, over the last couple of years. I, I don't think anybody was fully expecting that or, or prepared for that, but that's a good example of if we can set ourselves up when new things come along, when disruptive things come along, to figure out what works, what advances our city's goals and advances our community well-being, how do we adapt and, and regulate effectively or incorporate benefits effectively or manage uh, externalities in a way that actually serves our community well. Um, we want a set of tactics and actions, again, that's uh, not just for us in the city government, but our education partners, the business community, service providers, and governments in the region. And we want it to align with the things that we're already doing in our framework for a sustainable city of well-being, which is the, the kind of architecture of our entire budget and our work as a city. Um, we'll also be, of course, preparing um, with, with our partners an analysis of global trends, and again, the foundation of all of this is an informed and engaged community that can help us move this forward. So just to walk you through um, what we'll be doing tonight, um, you'll hear from several of us. Um, we'll start off um, with Andy Agle, our Director of Housing and Economic Development, um, and soon to be uh, my colleague as uh, our um, Interim Assistant City Manager. He'll be talking about where we are today, giving you an overview of our uh, economy in Santa Monica currently. Sean Fernando, the lead of our uh, consulting partners at GuideHouse, We'll talk about the global trends that we're studying. Um, and then Jennifer Taylor from our Economic Development Division uh, will explain how we actually plan to work together um, with the community, with our tech and our business leaders to develop our economic sustainability strategy. And, and she will outline what we've accomplished um, thus far. 
and then I'll come back at the conclusion of the town hall um, to offer some closing thoughts and get some more of your input, um, which we will get also along the way, um, so that we can think about how we work together going forward on this. So again, I just want to thank you on behalf of the entire team at the city for being here, for spending your time, sharing your thoughts and energy with us. Um, we're excited about this conversation, we're excited about this project, um, and just excited to have you be a part of it. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Andy. Good evening, thanks for being here. Can everybody hear me? So as Anuj mentioned, my name is Andy Eagle. I'm the city's director of housing and economic development. And as we think about the long-term sustainability of our economy, we think it's important to first take a moment to think about what does our economy look like today. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes showing you some, some information that may help set that uh, beginning discussion point. So can we start with just a first a, a quick quiz, all right? So I've got some numbers on here. If you can help me answer what these things are. So 8.4, some of us think it's 8.3. What is that? Square, Square miles. miles of the city, right. And uh, it's somewhere between 8.3 and 8.4, which is why some of us say 8.3, others say 8.4. All right, how about, we're, these are the easy ones, right? 92306. Yep, population of the city. All right, what about 147040? Number of workers, was that it? So that is, that's actually the total number of workers in Santa Monica. In other words, it's the daytime population. If you don't include people who are coming in here to go to the beach or to, to um, visit from the region or the world, those are the number of people uh, working in Santa Monica. So that includes both those of us who live here and work here, as well as people who come into Santa Monica to work. And how about that last number, 86084? This is the hardest one, I think. Yes, income. So it's the median household income in Santa Monica. Okay, so you all know your Santa Monica facts really well. Right, you got them all. So, so let's put some of these in context. This is pretty small, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, walk you through some of them. So you all are familiar with the, the, uh, the map of Santa Monica. Just what that shows generally is the, um, the red is the um, sort of commercial areas, so that's where people are working. The uh, pink areas is generally residential. And then the green is generally governmental uses. So beaches and parks and city buildings, uh, those types of things. So you get a sense, I think most of us know that because we're here every day, where the, um, where the living tends to happen, where the working tends to happen. Just to compare some of the numbers, so in 2017, Santa Monica's household income was, was just over 86,000. For Los Angeles County, just over 61,000. Those numbers shifted a little bit in the last couple of years, but generally the, um, the difference in those. So top industries, so that these are 2018 numbers and it's by total payroll. And, and these are some important numbers. So these are based on um, industry classifications that the government puts together. And to give you a sense, so $2.7 billion of payroll is in the information industries. And so I think most of us would think of tech industries, but also include some media industries. And the second biggest, at about $2 billion, is professional, scientific, and technical, which covers a broad range of what we'd think of as different industries, but includes a little bit of crossover with some of the tech industries, also media, but gives you a sense of that's, that's $4.7 billion just in those sectors, which I think we would generally think of as knowledge-based sectors, so, so very large in, in Santa Monica. And the next largest, and the number there is 826 million, is hospitality, leisure, food services. So that's our hotels and our restaurants. Um, then the next one just give you a sense of, of the total payroll may be very different from who are the largest employers. And so you see UCLA Medical Center, largest employer in Santa Monica. Um, Santa Monica College, not far behind. And then so soon after that, our other major hospital, St. John's. But what's interesting is keep going down that list and you've got SNAP with about 1,400 employees. Five years ago, I think SNAP's presence in Santa Monica was zero, 
maybe not much higher than that. So just to give you a sense of how rapidly some of these changes are happening. After that, the next two, Activision and Lionsgate. So both um, important in the, the gaming and entertainment portions of our industry. So those are some pretty big numbers for that, that side of the, um, the information and media side of, of our economy. Uh, we mentioned the labor force of over 56,000. And then the other thing we just highlighted here is the richness of our educational institutions. So 30 educational institutions going all the way from Santa Monica College to our public and private schools, including a variety of, of private educational institutions. So this is another way to look at our industries. And within the, the wheel, the, the darker color is what would consider tradable sectors, or these are export sectors. So these are, are sectors that are primarily selling goods or services or knowledge to people who are outside of Santa Monica. So you look at the, the biggest one, so 30% there that um, we just discussed is within information, and 22% within professional, scientific, and technical. So looking at over half of the total payroll in the city from those knowledge-based industries that also are within those tradable sectors. And then you see coming up there, hospitality and leisure. Relatively small in terms of the local sectors, and the local sectors are those industries that are primarily serving Santa Monica. So things like the um, things like government, right? What I do, um, the uh, health services, education services, those types of things. And this is this is something I'm going to show you on the next slide to just give you a sense of how quickly some of these are shifting. So this is there's a lot of information in there, and probably if you're sitting in the back, it's small. So let me just let me just highlight some of the important things. So we talked about information, and in the in the third column, so this, this column right here is, is what we call, it's a locational quotient. And what it does is it compares employment in Santa Monica to the employment in Los Angeles County. So if we had a 1.0, that means that the employment in Santa Monica would essentially be identical to that in Los Angeles County within that sector. In this case, information is 3.07. So you see how much more important information industries are to our economy as, a, as compared to Los Angeles County as a whole. And then the, um, the next column shows employment growth over the last three years. So that's 29.9% for information. So you're seeing almost a 30% increase in jobs within the imp information sector. Uh, professional, scientific, and technical, is Similar in that regard, so the location quotient, 2.11, so quite a bit above that, that 1.0 place, and 11% growth over the last three years. So we're seeing that shift. What, what we're also seeing is, if you look at all the down arrows, is some of, um, some of the other industries, and if you can't see them, we've got hospitality, leisure, food services, finance and insurance, health and education, are actually dropping, have been dropping over this period. And those also, if you can see the numbers, so hospitality and leisure, not surprising, 1.39, right? It's above the, the Los Angeles regional average. We are a destination for tourists and visitors within the region, um, but not, not quite to the extent of how important uh, Silicon Beach and Hollywood are generally to the Santa Monica economy. And um, the, the other thing that this shows us is that our economy in some ways is becoming less diverse. So one of the things that's allowed Santa Monica to weather economic storms over time is the diversity of the economy. So if, if, certain, economy, if certain sectors are struggling, other sectors may s stay strong. And it's one of the things that we need to keep in mind that becoming less diverse is potentially creates risks down the line. The, the other thing to consider is those top two being knowledge-based um, jobs and industries. Also, generally, with the changes in the economy, with the disruptions, it's anticipated that those knowledge-based jobs will become more important, will become less vulnerable to replacement by machines and AI. And so, in some ways, that's something also we need to keep track of, of how do those how do the sort of good jobs, if you will, also compare with becoming more concentrated in certain industries? 
So there's a lot going on in this slide, and I, I can't even explain going what, what's going on. But, but I think the, the major point here is that the disruption that we're seeing around us, and that disruption goes from Anuj mentioned scooters, right? Disruption very visible, but there's also disruption happening in every industry and in every part of what we're doing. And it's really changing how our traditional business models have worked, our traditional economic models. And it's also, we're seeing some implications of that already today. The, the housing market, I think folks are familiar with the housing market in California, right? Major market failures ha happening right now when average people, average income people really can't afford housing generally in California, certainly in this region, and in Santa Monica. We're also seeing that um, income inequality is growing. So we're seeing more p people at the upper end making more and more, people at the lower end making less and less, and people in the middle are um, becoming a smaller portion of who we are. And I, I want to just highlight that last point, because what we're seeing at the national level what we're seeing at the state level is also true in California. So what this chart shows is it actually shows you the jobs in Santa Monica by industry and by the, um, the associated wages with those in different industries. So if you look up here at the very top, what would be high income jobs, so those jobs that are over $100,000 a year. So there's 30,000 of those jobs within Santa Monica. At the other end, we've got 40,000 jobs that are less than $50,000 per year. So we'd consider those more lower income jobs. And this, this middle income, which you'd think there sh should be some equal distribution, maybe low, middle, high, is we're down to, in, in today's economy, down to about 25,000 jobs. So if you think of sort of the, the history of our economy in America, the importance of middle ca class jobs, the jobs that allowed people to have safe housing, have secure futures for their families, we're struggling as, a, a, as an economy nationally, but it's also true in, in Santa Monica. And it's something that, as we think about what does the future economy look like, this issue of equity is incredibly important and I think forces us to think about what are the levers that we're able to shift as, an econ as a community, as a government, as stakeholders, as partners. Are there levers that we can shift to try to not further and in fact potentially undo some of these, these inequities that are getting worse within the economy? So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sean Fernando. He's our lead from GuideHouse, our partners on this effort. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Sean Fernando. Uh, I've got this rather elaborate title of Future Cities Director, but basically I'm a consultant, and uh, my, my, my job is to help cities around the world, and especially in the US, think about change and think about what the future looks like and how they can work with their communities to develop strategies, and develop sets of actions that to represent the expressed desires and the kind of outcomes that its citizens want. And so we're really privileged um, here today. I'm working with my uh, colleagues, Christy, who's out in the front, and Libby in the back to be assisting the city of Santa Monica in this really important endeavor. Um, so thank you also for your time um, to kind of to learn a little bit about this uh, project and how you might get plugged in and a little bit about what our next steps are. Um, what I'd like to do is spend just a few minutes talking about this kind of topic of global megatrends and what that means. Um, you know, we've seen, I'm just going to go back a couple of slides just to where Andy was. Um, I'd like, I, I think for me this chart is really instructive because so much of the American dream has been built on this promise that, you know, if you, if you can hold down a nine to five job, you can put a roof over your head and you can look after your children and you can have your, you know, your, your uh, uh, plot of land that you can call your own, your home, that kind of stability. That stability is now at risk because of, of a range of technological and business model trends that we're seeing. And I think Andy has kind of explained some of those disruptions that we're already seeing in Santa Monica. You know, we started out about 50 years ago as a, you know, as a manufacturing um, city. We then moved to tourism and services, and now we're kind of in this wave of tech and the kind of innovation economy that that implies. And so, you know, really for us, what we're trying to do is while this kind of looks like a wonkish kind of policy, um, you know, policy analysis, what's behind each of these data points are people, the Santa Monicans, they're people who spend their time uh, in work, who 
builds, who go through education, who builds careers, who kind of contribute to society. And so what I invite you to do today is, as, as you hear a little bit about Santa Monica 2050, these global megatrends, think about what it might mean for um, your own perspective, your past experiences, those of your children, those of your grandchildren, what it means for uh, the Santa Monica of the future. So I'm just going to flip through this concept of megatrends. So if you're not familiar with the term, um, we'll kind of, just to illustrate the point, you can go onto Google um, and you can type in the word megatrends and see what comes up. Basically, there's a lot. Um, so this particular picture came from um, a consulting firm that, uh, uh, that surveyed 500 top global CEOs. So you know, from, they went through the Fortune 500, they had phone calls and interviews with them, and they asked them, what are the global trends that you as a CEO are thinking about for your business and the future of your business and the future of society? And you know, these are some of the ideas that came up. One, rapid urbanization. So that's the idea of people moving into cities from, uh, from the countryside. Now, you know, in the US, that's less of an issue because the US urbanized sometime in the, uh, in the 60s, but in a lot of the world, that urbanization is still taking place. And what that means is people are moving into cities, there's efficiencies with that because um, you know that they, um, you know, in terms of kind of natural, um, you know, resource consumption, but there's also inefficiencies because it re it means congestion, it means um, higher usage of concrete and glass and infrastructure and things like that. And so this idea of rapid urbanization is one that has come up repeatedly um, through uh, through this kind of dialogue. The second one is climate change and resource scarcity. This is a real thing. Um, the UNFCCC uh, indicates that we've got about 10 years to reverse and save the climate. We're at about 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what happens when you get to that point is that we start to see these non-linear effects where you see kind of glaciers melt. You see the impacts of climate change start to affect not just coastal communities, but global weather patterns and what that means for crop production, what that means for biodiversity and things such as that. This third me megatrend here, um, shifts in global economic power. Um, you know, the U.S. has spent the last, you know, 60 years of the last century kind of dominant in terms of geopolitics and the economy. It used to be a manufacturing hub. Now a lot of that is moving to other parts of the world. It's moving to Asia. Um, the world is increasingly and once again more multipolar. Um, and so that has changes and ripple effects in terms of what, you know, cities in the U.S. and in, and in other parts of the world can do. We're also seeing demographic and social change. Uh, we're living longer, which is a great thing. Um, we're seeing you know, greater fluidity in immigration between countries and between places. Um, and that yields uh, a number of kind of impacts related to that. And finally, we're also seeing technological breakthroughs. You know, we're seeing PCs, we're seeing the internet, we're seeing mobile technology and that kind of thing. And, and so when we think about megatrends, there are a range of different concepts that we might talk about. I'm just going to flick through a few of these just to illustrate a few more. Um, this particular graphic is another take on it, megatrends. I'll just call out a few here because it's quite a busy slide. You know, we're seeing impactful technology, which is kind of the same thing as what I was just talking about, right? Um, we're seeing these evolving communities, uh, rapid urbanization again, shifts in economic power, resource scarcity. Uh, the year I was born, um, the population of the world was about, uh, I think, 4.8 billion. Now it's about 7.8. And so we're seeing not just urbanization, but growth in absolute terms. And just to, part, uh, just to create a few more examples of megatrends, this particular take is on a technology-focused uh, megatrend. So we're seeing augmented technology, uh, augmented reality, um, convergence and connectivity, uh, smart security, cashless solutions and e-payment, you know, the rise of... Apple Pay and um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which, um, which, is putting, which is testing the limits of fiat currency. Uh, another one again, um, you know, similar change in demographics, new technologies. Basically, there's a range of these megatrends, and there's no one clear definition um, that, that exists. But for the purposes of Santa Monica 2050, what we were able to identify as the common themes that define a megatrend is these significant disruptive changes that cause economic and social upheaval, right? So significant disruptive changes that cause economic and social upheaval. And that kind of relates back to what Andy was talking about earlier, about the way that the, the changes in Santa Monica's workforce and in Santa Monica's economy, 
Um, this kind of competition for jobs, this competition for talent, for Santa Monica as a desirable place to live and to work. And so when we're thinking about Santa Monica 2050, um, the city, and to, this is to Anuja's point, really needs to think about how can the city, with a capital C, work with community partners, work with the private sector, with the social sector, to develop coordinated tactics and strategies that it can take the best things away from these global megatrends, but also make sure that it's, that it's insulated and hedged against some of the negative consequences of that, such as artificial intelligence taking people's jobs away. And so if you look at kind of a megatrend, you see these two pictures. You might have seen this before. So this picture in, at the top is from uh, the Pope's funeral in 2005, and this is in, um, in the Vatican. And this picture below is when this, uh, Pope Benedict stepped down in 2013. So these significant economic and technological disruptions can happen like that. They're not abstract things. They've, they've happened in this short period of eight years, the kind of proliferation of smart devices. And so, you know, these are not necessarily kind of things which kind of exist in like an economic textbook. They're things that we experience and feel on a day-to-day -day basis. This happens right here in Santa Monica as well. So if we look back to 2015 on the beach, we see changes in three years later. Shall I do that again? 2015, 2018. And so we're seeing the growth of these, you know, these disruptions, not just at a big scale, at a macro scale, but also here in Santa Monica. And the purpose of this is not really to say that these, are, these megatrends are, 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 are bad or good and not make a subjective um, kind of position on that. That's really a question for the, Santa Monica, for the community of Santa Monica, but really to illustrate the point that these disruptions can come quickly. And so if we want to think about maintaining an inclusive and equitable economy, we need to be ahead of the curve in planning for those kinds of disruption and change. So with that kind of context, what the city has kind of been through over the last three years or so is um, doing some research to figure out like what are the trends that are likely to affect the sustainability of Santa Monica. And so this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of associated trends such as you know, climate and equity and housing, which of course is part of the conversation which are addressed through other priorities and strategies that the city has. But for the purpose of Santa Monica 2050, um, the city working together with us identified these three trends which we wanted to focus on. So the first is connectivity. Um, and this really means this kind of exponential increase in the ways in which people, goods, and services are connected to themselves and each other. So, you know, the example that I had on a couple of slides ago about mobile devices, you know, we can send, like, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not from the US, I text and Skype and voicemail and um, video call my parents in the UK on a daily basis, and that would be unthinkable or very difficult at least, at, you know, uh, about 10 years or so ago. So this idea of like connectivity between people, between devices and places that allows us to um, experience and maintain relationships with, uh, with one another. The second trend which you may have heard about um, is artificial intelligence. And this is basically computers that can think for themselves. Um, but the definition that we can use here is these computing systems with cognitive functions that demonstrate intelligent behavior and which iteratively learn and perform increasingly complex tasks. So basically, you know, the computer of old was you would program it with a certain set of rules and subroutines that it would then go away and do. But with artificial intelligence, you're teaching the computer how to think. So you're giving it patterns to recognize, and you're giving it with a tool set for uh, what it ought to do when it recognizes and detects one of those, pat one of those patterns. User options, the third one here, and this is really about the ubiquity of choice and customization, which is enabled by greater data comparison and use. And what that really means is it's basically choice. Um, and I kind of think of it as, you know, um, in a day-to-day -day example, McDonald's didn't used to have, you know, all-day breakfast. Like, I don't know if you, anybody eats at McDonald's, but this kind of idea that you can have anything instantaneously on demand any way you like it. You no longer just have to settle for your cheeseburger. If anybody eats that, you can have you know, your McMuffin or whatever that might be. And so that's probably a bad example. Um, <laughs> but this idea that kind of user options kind of exist in terms of you know, how we access mobility, you know, whether we want to take an Uber or whether we want to take a bike or whether we want to take a bus. 
but also user options in terms of our healthcare plans. Um, do we include the you know, dental and vision combo? Do we go for a different tier? That kind of thing. And so there's this kind of idea that with greater data and greater information comes greater possibility. And so understanding what that might mean for Santa Monicans is, is part of this work as well. So I'm just going to spend a couple of slides just walking through with you a few examples just to kind of illustrate the points of each of these trends. Um, yeah. So just looking at connectivity first. So, you know, really kind of object sensors and devices connected to the internet um, and to one another may lead to about 15, million data 15 billion data connections by 2025. Basically, every device that you add on to the network, whether that's your smartphone or something, or your wearable or your Fitbit or your computer, when it's connected to the internet, it's connected to each other, and you get an exponential increase in the number of connections that are possible through that. And so, you know, we're, eight, we're on course to hit about 15 billion data connections by 2025, which is, you'll obviously know, more than the population of the planet. Um, so connectivity has already kind of affected how we interact with, you know, businesses, government, and each other. So, for example, we have wearable fitness de devices, some of us. Um, this tracks our heart rate. It tracks how many steps we've taken. Um, in some features, it tells you if you've fallen down and it alerts your next of kin or somebody that you, somebody that you know so that you can detect and maintain that continuous stream of information about your well-being and your physiological condition. Um, this idea of like platforms to find and build communities. So, you know, the way that you might kind of interact with one another. We, we're doing this right now through an in-person town hall, but equally people get together in online forums and exchange ideas and share information. Um, these are kind of, you know, websites such as Nextdoor and that kind of thing where, you know, people really kind of talk about the priorities and um, uh, for their neighborhood and allows them other ways in which they can connect with one another. Um, Connectivity also has really positive impacts in terms of real-time emergency alerts. So, you know, if there's a quake, um, because when we're connected, we're going to get this vibration in our pocket that tells us that a quake was detected X number of miles away, and therefore there is something that we should do, some action that we should take as a result of that. And also, you know, as I kind of mentioned and illustrated in that kind of cute picture earlier, we're getting connected mobility options. So, you know, we're ten, th we're ten million population county um, spread across several thousands of square miles. We're, we're sprawling. Um, and so how do you kind of connect the dots and create seamless transportation options for one another? You know, we have one metro agency, but we have 26 or so other transit agencies. How can connectivity help improve the interaction to allow you to get from Santa Monica to downtown LA or Playa Vista in the most affordable, convenient, and sustainable way? So with artificial intelligence now, um, there's this in interesting statistic from Brookings Institution, who you, who you may know. Um, so they, they have kind of undertaken an exercise where they've looked at all of the, what they call the automation potential of all the US metropolitan areas. And so um, what they've determined is that in the LA metro, which includes LA, Long Beach, uh, out to um, Riverside and San Bernardino, 46% of tasks across all occupations are susceptible to automation. Okay, I'll explain what that means. So probably when you hear about artificial intelligence and, and automation, you think of, you know, is my job at risk? Um, and what, is my job going to become obsolete? Um, and what are, the, uh, what are the consequences of AI? For some categories, that may be true. Um, there are jobs that, that used to exist in, in, in the past which no longer exist today and AI may have some of that impact. But equally, what's what the kind of data is telling us is that there's gonna be some function of our jobs, some fraction of our jobs. You know, if we spend eight hours a day at work, maybe two hours of that, which can be more expeditiously done by AI or by a computer. And so we get two hours freed up to do something else. And so that's what this kind of statistic means, that 46% of tasks across all occupations are susceptible to automation. So if you imagine, you know, a diverse trillion dollar economy like LA, that might be, you know, certain areas such as logistics. Um, and that might be certain types of like data entry jobs. Um, and what does that mean for the people behind those jobs? Because this is not just a statistic for the sake of, you know, demonstrating our kind of technological um, um, innovation potential, but there's human meaning behind that. There are people's livelihoods at stake and people's careers and well-being too. 
Um, so just to kind of paint a couple of illustrations, you know, we're seeing AI with digital assistants. If those of you who have you know, Alexa or Amazon Echo or uh, Google Home, we're getting these little gadgets that we set on our, on our fireplace or something like that, and we kind of, we ask it questions and it uses AI to scan the internet to provide responses. So I use it for weather, like you know, Google what is the weather today. And actually since moving to Southern California, I found that pretty pointless because it's generally <laughs> always sunny. <laughs> Um, but you, you get that kind of idea. You know, you can kind of you, you can outsource that kind of search field query to you know a robot that essentially does that for you. Whereas previously, I remember when I was a kid growing up, you know, we'd keep a little clipping of the newspaper which would tell you the five-day weather forecast, right? So these kinds of things can kind of change um, things that we've otherwise grown up uh, doing. Um, we're seeing product recommendations, so. Um, you know, if you go into Amazon, uh, just given your search history, it can tell you uh, what thing, what kind of things you might need. So, kind of funny story that um, you know that that there's this um, anecdote of Amazon being able to te to detect if uh, you know certain women are pregnant before they know it, just based on their search history, because they're typing up and searching for certain items which are um, which are more kind of affiliated with. Uh, you know, being pregnant. And so we're getting these recommendations pushed onto us. So even though we're not looking for something, you know, there's a computer somewhere saying, have you also thought of this? Would you be interested in this? So what does that mean for our choices? What does this mean for the kind of set of data that uh, and the kind of um, the information landscape that we inhabit? We're also seeing self-driving and parking cars. Um, so we talk a lot about artificial intelligence and, you know, the intersection of what happens with that and mobility. You know, it started off with, you know, let's say, um, uh, what do you call it? Cruise control. It started off with cru cruise control as a very simple way of kind of maintaining speed on a certain heading. It then evolved into lane assist. Now it's evolved into parking assist. And eventually it may in, uh, evolve into um, further kind of complex maneuvers that you can undertake in a vehicle. And so, you know, what does AI mean for self-driving cars in the future? Does this mean that, you know, rather than spending two hours driving yourself to work every day, you can sit in a car and um, do work or do something else? Or does it mean that you live further away because, uh, because your, your journey, you've become desensitized to a long distance trip? And then another example, finally, of AI is kind of chatbots. So sometimes you see these if you kind of go into a customer service center uh, online and you want to kind of make a refund or do some kind of interaction. Um, oftentimes you'll see some kind of chatbot to field your request where you put in your product ID or your kind of reference code, and then it takes you through a set of intelligent kind of questions to determine um, what your needs are. Okay. So moving on finally to this kind of user options choice uh, mega trend. So I mean, a way of kind of illustrating that is if you take out your phones, those of you who, who have one, um, if you go to the app store, if you're on the iOS system, there are about two million apps that are currently available on the Apple store. So two million, you know, two million apps tailored for different types of usage, everything from telling you what the weather is to booking you uh, a mode of transportation to take you where you need to go to reading the news. And so we're seeing you know, a lot of how user options are changing the way in which we shop, we travel, we work, and we interact. You know, we're seeing more personalized goods and services, you know, the McDonald's example, like I said. Um, we're seeing comparison apps. You know, if you want to um, dine at a certain place, it give, uh, you know, certain apps can provide you recommendations for what you might also, what others also said about the experience dining there, you know, reviews, rating apps, that kind of thing. And then you can use that information to decide whether or not you want to go there or not. We're seeing um, user options, and I think this is the best example actually, kind of inform routing options. So when you put in, when you search into Google Maps where you want to go, you, you, it provides you with a set of, you know, maybe two to three to four um, different options for that, that uh, provide you options for how you can get to where you need to go. And then in the kind of field of kind of workplace, we're seeing user options play out in terms of flexible and remote working arrangements. So, you know, this idea of the nine to five job that we all kind of used to have is evolving. Um, we've heard about things such as the gig economy where you can, you know, choose the hours in which you want to work. Um, and there'll be employers that um, will, ex will build a schedule around your flexibility and around your availability. And so this kind of flexibility and in working and remote arrangements. Now it's worth noting 
that not everyone has this set of, you know, this flexible working arrangements. And this is the point of Santa Monica 2050. Each of these trends are going to impact Santa Monicans in different ways based on their socioeconomic and demographic kind of situation. And so the, the, the priority of this work is really to understand how do these trends impact with Santa Monicans and how might the city work with you to develop strategies in, in terms of getting ahead of it. So what I'd like to do now is kind of get a bit of feedback from you all. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So just can I take a pulse? Does everybody have a mobile phone in the room? Is there anybody who doesn't? Okay, we're going to uh, do some audience interactions. So you're going to require your mobile phones for this um, and sending a text message to a number, which I'll, which I'll explain in a few minutes. For those of you who don't have a mobile phone, um, there are some paper forms going around which you can fill in and provide us with comment and feedback, and we'll collect that at the end of the session. Um, but essentially, we'd like to kind of hear a little bit from you about the trends as, as I've explained them to you and about your feedback on them. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could take out your phone, you're going to open your messaging app, and you're going to type the number 22333. Okay, text that number in the two field, and then you're going to type in um, these letters here: H P H E L A N 388. That's basically Harrison Phelan. He's our colleague. He's away getting married right now, but that's um, th that's. Uh, so if you enter 22333 and then that sequence of letters, that will Enter and then hit send. That will enter you into our kind of online participation um, uh, tool. I'll give you a few seconds for you all to do that. Case sensitive? Yes, it's case sensitive. Everybody got that? So two two three 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 and then H P H E L A N three eight eight and hit send. Service to nice. Is anybody else having that issue? And if you don't, uh, if you don't have a phone with you, that's no problem at all. We've got paper copies that uh, one of our colleagues will. Everybody's got one. Okay, great. Okay, nod of heads if you're inside the system. If you manage to get through those steps, yes, yes, a few yeses. Okay, great. So. I'm going to throw a few questions at you, and the idea is that you text you text the letter that responds to uh, that question that I framed to you, and we're going to see the results of your answers in real time. Okay. So question number one. So I mentioned three trends, right? So which of these trends are you most excited about? Text A if you're excited about connectivity. Text B if you're excited about artificial intelligence. Text C if it's user options, and text D if it's something else. Should I? Is everybody in? Okay, so the number to text is 22333, three, three, three. and it's. What's the code? I don't have it. 3388. Three, Yeah. Three eight eight. So it's. <laughs> yeah. So. So the code. So the code to enter is H P H E L A N three eight eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All caps, and once again, that that code and that number to text is up at the top here. Okay, and then once you're in, you're going to type and send either the letters A or B or C or D. Oh wow! Okay. Yes, yes, we're still working on the texting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do it on the website as well if you're if you're doing that. 
So this question is, which trend are you most excited about? And so we asked you, which of the three trends plus an other category? And it looks like so far, well, 45% of you are excited about this idea of connectivity. OK. That's we'll give you a couple more seconds just to kind of fire off those uh, other texts. If there are some of you who are more interested in user options, now's the time to press number C and get those in. Oh, we're into 48. Let's get it about 50. OK. I'm sorry? You can, you can vote again. You can double vote. People rig the system that way. They type in, they put in A or B or C multiple times, and then it goes up. OK, so it sounds like there's you know, pr pretty much consensus that the trend that you are all excited about as Santa Monica's uh, here today on the 24th of February is connectivity. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about why you chose connectivity. Um, we, we've only got one mic, so it's, it's fine. But if you could just sh shout out anybody who wants to volunteer an opinion on why you chose connectivity, what's makes, wh why you're excited by it. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jim Hayes. Karen and I live within walking distance of here, and we have a little bit of knowledge of this area because we run the International Professional Society of Fiber Optics from here in Santa Monica, which makes all this work. Santa Monica, in 2002, had a guy named Jory Wolf who had a vision for the future, and Jory started building one of the best city fiber optic networks in the world. Mm -hmm. okay? In 2007, Karen and I and our organization worked with Verizon to get Fios off the ground. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the first cities to get fiber to the home. Okay? Anybody here have fiber to the home? One, two, two. yeah, three, okay? Today, in Santa Monica, where we live, okay, we have two internet services. Okay? One of them is okay. The other one is terrible. Okay? Nobody's doing fiber to the home anymore mm -hmm. because Verizon sold the service to a company which is now going bankrupt. Right? Anybody here from Frontier? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're going bankrupt. They're going bankrupt. Yeah. If you own a cell phone in our neighborhood and you need to make a call, you might have one bar, occasionally two, but you see people all the time out on the street trying to make a call. Okay? Now, how can a city which started off with such a bang back in Jury's days, get to where it is now. Yeah. Great, great point and great question. That's um, that those are the type of issues that is like is inherently part of this work. This idea that you know you kind of pursue a technology which seems promising at the time. Um, the technology might be sound, um, but then the kind of business environment or the commercial environment changes. And so, you know, what you don't want to do is be left with, you know, stranded infrastructure, stranded assets. And so we have things such as 5G coming along and what that means for connectivity and whether that's. <laughs> I just yeah. Make point. Okay, 5G, if you follow it in the real industry, is known as 5G Wiz. Mm -hmm. And it's simply an excuse for the phone companies to promise something mm -hmm. because they don't want to fix what they have mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great, great point. No problem. But, but, no, that's, that's really valid. Thank you for your input. Anybody else, what excites you about connectivity? Anybody want to venture an idea? Yes, madam. Well, I'm just thinking it's funny that I want connectivity, but I think some of the, the things that I fear is also connectivity, uh -huh. okay. the negative connectivity. Um, but, the, but at the same time, yeah, like I, connecting to others in a, an easier way or something like that. 
Well, that's that's a great point that you raise. And We're going to come. Necessarily have to be technology. Yeah. So like emotional connectivity and fun. Yeah. Great. So it's a great point that you <laughs> raised some of your fears as well. We'll get to that in actually a second question. Um, but does anybody want to stay with the idea of what excites them about connectivity? Yes. Connectivity as it connects to mobility okay. and not just technology, but and what technology connects with mobility, just kind of the circle of how that works. Yeah. And that's interesting to you because in Santa Monica, mobility is such an important issue in terms of how people move within the city, but also outside of the city. Is that is that the kind of context? As we grow the options so that people have so that people can have the ability to change potentially what they're doing now. So that we have we can eliminate some of the the impacts that are negative and create um, situations that are more positive and breed more connectivity in mobility and to their neighborhoods. Got it. Thank you. Great. Well that was um that was really helpful. We're gonna, so it's great that we kind of got a sense and got a kind of pulse of what you in the room here are kind of prioritizing and what's exciting to you from these trends. Um, so you'll also know that kind of, have you seen that game show where it says our survey said, I think it's called Family Affairs here or something, Family Fortune, Family Feud. Yeah, so this is that. So we've got a survey online on the Santa Monica 2050 website. Uh, we asked about 90, well, we asked the community in Santa Monica so far, we've got about 90 responses, that same question. So what excites them about, um, about each of these trends? And so you'll see it's a much more equal distribution here. So, you know, we had connectivity at about 48%. Here you'll see that it's kind of, you know, divided three ways. And so I'll just pick out a few of the kind of responses that we got. We also asked folks who were submitted, who were filling in the survey to provide some idea for kind of why they, um, why they prioritize or why they chose a specific trend and why they didn't choose another. I'll just call out a few of them. Um, so one person said, to make the community feel more connected with our neighbors, less traffic through connectivity and remote options, which I think is similar to your point. Another person said about AI, Autonomous vehicles should reduce vehicle ownership, improving traffic, and freeing up space. Yeah. Safer, cleaner, more efficient, and productive environments, so there's less waste. And then for user options, somebody said, uh, I'm hoping that it will be easier for people with disabilities to access goods and services. Identifying and engaging with recreational opportunities and creative spaces and celebrations. Okay. Does that generally resonate with folks in the room, those kinds of priorities? Good. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to now with. I'm sorry? Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to dig into uh, our team's laptop and get back to you. I don't have that off, that off the top of my head. Yeah. So we asked you about which of these trends excites you? And we're now going to kind of flip the question. We're going to ask you, which of these trends are you most concerned about? OK, and it may be the same answer. So once again, if you wouldn't mind getting out your phones, um, and you can see the instructions at the top here, over there. And all you have to do is just type in the letters A, B, C, or D to represent which trend you are most concerned about. So type in A if you're concerned about connectivity, B if you're concerned about AI, C if it's user options, and D if it's other. So basically going back to the same text. Same text, yeah. All you have to do is just uh, yeah, press one of those numbers. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're nervous about it, or you're worried. You're worried about the impact. You're worried about readiness. You're worried about businesses not being mature enough to understand and develop you know, the types of infrastructure and work with the city, that kind of thing. We'll give it about another 30 seconds for you to fire off your responses. Okay. Everybody got their text fired away? Great. So, okay, that's a probably a resounding win, although maybe not, wouldn't call it a win. <laughs> a loss for artificial intelligence. It seems like given that who's in the room tonight, it seems that AI is the trend that you're most concerned about. Let's hear a little bit about, about why that is. Would anybody like to venture kind of why they chose AI as the, the trend that they're most concerned about? 
Yes, ma'am. Well, I mean, we hear a lot about the surveillance state, and it's kind of that, you know, we don't really want to give up our privacy and all of our inner workings for a household yeah. to a co corporation, potentially. Yeah, a corporation who could use AI to use it, sell it, sell it to insurance carriers, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Well, I think people are concerned because we think that our human brain is pretty good and we don't want to see all that kind of stuff taken away or how it would be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. So the loss of, I mean, are you referring to, yeah, the humanness, the humanity, yeah. Do you think AI could be, do you think AI could at some point reflect our humanity if we design it the right way, if we impart our values on it? Is that, is that a possibility? Well, as long as we give up our personal power to you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to um, provide insight on your thoughts on why you voted AI as a trend that you're most concerned about? Yes, sir. I mean, I guess a lot of endeavors could be amp amplified or enhanced with AI, but a yeah. lot of things can become redundant. A lot of people, what they do, uh, they have to find something else to do in school. But the major professions, I mean, not just uh, chores. I mean, I mean, I don't know where medical doctors or lawyers or accountants or very skilled professionals will have a function if a machine could do it in a quarter of a second better than any of them can, whatever programming they have is superior yeah. to solving problems. I think that's an important point, and like given what we've seen in our research, like AI and these trends, I mean, on, there are positive consequences to some of them, sure, but there are also negative ones, and the negative consequences are like indiscriminate. Um, they can atter they can affect. Um, you know, certain kind of classes and groups of jobs, but even in those who have spent, you know, $100,000 getting an Ivy League education, those kinds of jobs, which we would otherwise have gone into, may no longer exist or may exist in a different way because of AI. Yes, sir. I voted for user options, and the reason yeah. was because if you look at the productivity, and you look at artificial intelligence, and you take your work away from what it can do, or you're adding a lot of free time, and unless you provide them with the services and the needs that they have in the community, you'll get a bunch of lonely people out there. Yeah. That's a great point. Yes. One last one. Yeah, I, I would concur with that. And, and artificial intelligence, I think, is, is important and it's scary and exciting both at the same time. But I voted D because I think climate change is more important than that. And it's if we don't get climate change under control, none of this is going to matter. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a great point. And you know, there's a lot that there are a lot of other megatrends which, you know, aren't called out here, but they are megatrends nonetheless. So climate change, equity, housing, to name three. Um, the purposes of this work is not to claim that this Santa Monica 2050 strategy is going to solve everything. It's really going to. It's really targeted at solving the things which it can focus and address on. And the way that it works is that the city of Santa Monica has a range of other uh, other policies and strategies, such as the loose, such as a framework, which are better tailored uh, and better equipped to address some of those equally um, equally significant and strategic uh, mega trends. If I may just yeah. add, I think the lens of climate change needs to be added to everything, and that's just my belief. No matter what you're trying to do, it's Okay, I think we've got time for one last one. The gentleman in the middle. Uh, anybody old enough to know 2001 Space Odyssey? Yes. Where the computer will refuse to do what you want. Yes. So artificial intelligence will go to the next app, and they will start making <coughs> a decision. Is this ethical decision mm -hmm. before I can program? Yeah. The good old HAL have computer and said, sorry, I can't follow the order. Mm -hmm. So the artificial intelligence will permeate into beyond human intelligence. Good point. That's Good point. Th thank you. Great, great points. We're gonna we're gonna pause it now because we've got quite a bit more content to go into. Um, so just moving on to our next slide and our next activity. Can we? Okay, great. So 
again, we did a kind of uh, our survey said kind of thing. And from our survey, I think most people probably concurred with the sentiment of expressed in the room that AI is um, the trend area which was probably the most concerning. And so let's hear a little bit about what they said. Um, so for connectivity, some of the folks said that security and privacy, which is a topic that came up, increased connectivity means more potential points of failure and more potential for abuse. It may be used to market products to people rather than help them. That's important. With AI, this idea of like replacing jobs, as we've heard, and losing privacy, less community interaction and connectivity. And then um, a, a question about the security and the hackability of those systems. With user options, um, more person-to-person -person deliveries create packaging waste, pollution, and traffic congestion, I think all of which touch upon this kind of connection with climate change that we've heard of as well. And again, for other, we'll have to go back to uh, our database to find out what they said about that. So it's great that, you know, we, we've been talking about the kind of trends for you know, a few minutes now, but what we've kind of been pivoting to is this kind of the lens through which we should understand these trends. And so, you know, I think that was a specific word that was used. Um, and what we want to do is develop a strategy, not, no, you know, not, one that is not, not one that is focused on artificial intelligence or user options or connectivity, but really takes those trends and then translate them, translates them in such a way that we can understand how they might manif manifest in Santa Monica. And so the way that we're going to look at these trends are through these five aspects. So the economy and the workforce, mobility, built environment, community well-being and government. And so we're looking at each of these trends for the economy and the workforce, for example, in looking at the dis disruptions in economic sectors, in occupations, in productivity. What happens when those um, you know, Ivy League educated accountants or lawyers are suddenly being automated away? Uh, what does this mean for the future of retail which, uh, and hospitality and leisure, which has been a foundational part of Santa Monica's economy for the last 30 years? What does it mean for mobility? Um, the disruptions to the ability of people and goods to move freely. If we have, if we have this kind of growth in, uh, in, in jobs and the desire to live and work in Santa Monica, what does it mean for people who, who can live, uh, live and move within Santa Monica? And what does that, the consequences of that mean for our carbon footprint from transportation? What does these trends mean to the built environment? So that's disruptions to the space in which people live, work and recreate and the relationship between people and places. Um, you know, how do, what does this mean for our uh, open spaces and our placemaking, and how do we kind of create and sustain Santa Monica as this kind of destination where people want to still come live and work within an inclusive and an equitable society? Community well-being, which is the thread that runs through all of this. Um, what do these disruptions mean for residents? Mental and physical well-being, their quality of life, uh, their sense of purpose, and I think that's a really important one because we're talking about these trends which really go to um, the crux of what people's livelihoods and careers have been. Um, you know, if you're like that, there's been several instances where you know I'm taking a Lyft or an Uber or something, and I'm having a conversation with the driver, and they weren't always a Uber or Lyft driver. They did something else before that, but they lost their job because of either offshoring or because of automation or some other. Um, some other kind of trend that disrupted them. And so, you know, that Uber drivers not by choice, but by, um, but by consequence of these trends and the way in which they've played out. And so what does it mean for, you know, a kind of sense of, of purpose, you know, as Santa Monicans, as people who live and, and, and um, occupy this part of Southern California? And then finally, government. What do these trends mean in terms of the disruptions to which government functions, it provides public services, it looks after your tax dollars. And so what these kind of, uh, what these lenses of impact are, um, are kind of really designed to do is take the trends that we've discussed and translate them into understandable things and activities that can be addressed and can be programmed within Santa Monica. So what we're gonna do now is a similar exercise, hopefully you've got your phones open for the last one of these. Um, you know, we've laid out these five areas, um, and we're going to ask you to tell us which of these areas are the ones that the city should prioritize when considering how to, uh, how to look at the global trends. So all you have to do once again is just type in the letters either A, B, C, D, or E now. And the instructions are at the top here again. You shouldn't need to enter that 
once more time. You, you just need to input the letter and hit send. So type in A if you think that we should focus on economy and workforce. Type in B if it's mobility. C if it's the built environment. D if it's community well-being. E if it's government. And F if it's other. And again, you can rig the poll. You can type in your letter multiple times if you feel particularly strongly about one impact area. I'm sorry? Does it only take it once? Oh, OK. OK. Scratch that then. OK. Then you can change it. You can go you know, A, A to F if you feel all of these deserve equal weighting. OK. Nobody cares about government, seriously? Uh, no, you put A and then B in a separate text. Oh. Yeah. Does it do that? Oh, just one. Okay, I'm sorry. It just does one. You're forced to choose. Okay. <clears throat> Can we get one for government? Does it no? <laughs> I feel bad. I don't want our city hall staff to feel offended here. <laughs> okay. Work for yourselves, great. Okay, got it. So the question is, which of these areas should the city prioritize in considering how to um, address these global trends? And it looks like the winner is community well-being. So that was, you know, by a vote of 39%, the, from what we've heard from you, the most important area for uh, these trends to be understood and translated into. So what it means for our physiological and mental and physical well-being, what it means for our careers and livelihoods, and our good lives. Um, set coming up second is the economy and workforce, which is sort of related, which is very much related to that, um, but it's more kind of like a, a macroeconomic view. How do we kind of main, maintain that we have enough good jobs in the city? That p that teenagers leaving high school are on career pathways that they've been trained up for the jobs that are relevant to the future, and that we're economically success successful and and we maintain this kind of position of economic vitality. Coming in third place is mobility. Uh, fourth is the built environment. Um, and fifth is other. So let's go the other way around first. Can we hear from whoever voted, or wh those of you who voted for other, and what that category might have been? <coughs> Anybody? No? OK. We'll do one for built environment then. Uh, anybody want to make a punt for built environment? Yes, sir. Yeah. I think that if, um, if we redesign how we think about housing infrastructure, and of course this is like half government too because the policy associated with housing infrastructure is very integrated into it, but if we can create affordable living options, especially in transit or in support um, we kind of eliminate problems with mobility, we eliminate problems with community development. It's, um, we have to revolutionize how we think about the areas that people have access to, not only for living, but also for working. Yeah. So it's kind of about the co-location of people with jobs, but getting to those places with seamless, clean, sustainable mobility as well. Yeah, I think you raised an important point because, to be honest, it's a bit of a contrived exercise to force these five buckets into five different things. They're all interrelated. Um, but that's a great one. Does anybody want to... Yes, sir. I just want to point out, I, I, I don't want to speak for everyone and how they voted. The E not getting anything. The E not getting anything, I think, is almost taken for granted. The government would interconnect all the others, but that's why I think that you can't get a vote. Okay, so Thank you. <laughs> So you're saying it's a given, it's, a, it's the kind of baseline that the government will keep up, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a great interpretation. Sorry, man. Second that, okay. Third, fourth, have we got a fourth? Let's go for fourth. That's, that's a great point. And, uh, and again, I think um, there's a number of other categories that we could fit in here. Right? I think natural environment is one. Um, equity is another. Inclusiveness, um, sustainability, housing. Um, 
I think that the, the point of this is not to exclude those other important imperatives or policy areas, but really kind of to anchor Santa Monica 2050 in a set of impact areas that haven't um, that haven't necessarily been covered by other policies and frameworks. So, for example, um, you know, there's the, the loose and the framework talks very very deeply about the natural environment and climate, and so what we're trying to do is kind of create those as separate um, separate documents and separate policy policy areas. So let's do one a few more kind of comments on community well-being. Does anybody else want to kind of venture reasons and offer opinions on why you chose community well-being as an area for prioritization? Yes. I can tell you why I didn't choose it. Yeah. Because I think it's uh, everything else is related to and builds community well-being. <coughs> um, we have to elevate some of the other places before we can achieve well-being. Yeah. Um, you know, I did this one online, and I chose other, and I meant climate change, and also um, the built environment, because I think that Santa Monica is going to get to see a lot of climate refugees that will have to be housed or something. I mean, we're, we have such a great climate, it's going to get so hot inland. I, I, I think that a lot of people will inundate Santa Monica from other areas. And so that should be an area for focus because we need to be ensure that we can um, provide comfort and refuge to those refugees or something else. Somehow house them or accommodate some of them. I mean, I don't know what will happen. Yeah. I think it's going to get very bad. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Community well being um, is what sounds to be. Everything that you want to get out of San Monica would be to be able to feel safe walking, riding a bike, yeah. maybe have activities, dancing, music, yeah. yoga, uh, social events, community events, or spiritual, religious, other things that form the community <coughs> that bring people together and make the community. So I think that's everything that's great about living here, or would be, and, and that's why I would make that the priority. That's, that's, that's a great point, and I think that's also connected to a lot of the trends that we're seeing. I mean, nowadays we're glued to our phones and we're connected to the online world, but we're disconnected from our community. And we're connected. Yeah, I, think, I yeah. think it's like with people instead of only on the line. I mean, and, and I think preventatively, health-wise, living in a place with a good environment, if there was more group activities, more social activities, and constantly available, yeah. and easy, easy to partake in, I think that would be only a plus for the whole community. Great, thank you. One last one from the lady over here. And to segue with that, maybe rather than trying to embrace some of these mega trends, we should, Santa Monica should resist this them and create these zones where there's no connectivity and there's, you know, sort of like at the standpoint and say, hey, we're about people, we're about nature, we're about, yeah. I guess that goes back to some roots of Santa Monica. Yeah. Some old, sort of, take a stand against some of these <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, finally, uh, we've, we've asked you three questions now. Um, we're going to reflect back on our survey results once more. Um, and so, again, it seems like the people who are filling in the online survey can't quite choose. Um, they're not as, perhaps not as decisive as those in the room. Um, but it seems our distribution of results are between the economy and workforce, mobility, and community well-being as priority areas. And I think, um, and I think that is, um, you know, probably consistent in some ways with some of the views that we've heard here, but it sounds like there's more of a priority for those in the room to kind of focus on community well-being and really understand as we're developing the Santa Monica 2050 strategy, not talk about these trends and these technologies as kind of these abstract big picture context, uh, you know, ideas, but really understand and unpack them in ways that are meaningful to people who live and work and, and, and grow and learn and play in the city. So with that, I want to pass it to Jennifer Taylor from uh, the city to talk through uh, our next steps and what you can expect uh, the rest of the Santa Monica 2050 project to look like. Thank you. Great. Th thank you, Sean. Um, I'll be quick because I know people are 
tired. Um, but I just wanted to talk about where we're at now and what the next steps are um, and how you can be involved. So, um, so uh, as Anoush, Anoush mentioned at the outset of the program, the city is currently in the process of developing this long-term economic sustainability strategy that will prepare our city how to harness the global trends, how to maintain our economic viability. Um, I'm sorry, can no one hear me? Harness our economic vitality and improve our community well-being. Uh, the strategy development includes three parallel work streams. You can just go ahead and put these in here. So for the first segment, strategy development, that really builds upon what Sean has just talked to us about in terms of what are the global trends that are impacting our city over the next 30 years, helping to analyze their impacts, developing strategies to mitigate risks, and also to capitalize on the opportunities. The middle work stream, stakeholder engagement, so here tonight. Um, and it's really focused on collaborating with um, our residents, but also with um, our experts, too, in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors to help to co-develop the strategy and build a coalition to work together to achieve mutual goals. Uh, just important to stress that the city is just one player in Santa Monica and the region's economy. Uh, and we recognize that in order to succeed, we really need to work together to create real change. So it's not just about our city in isolation. Um, and then finally, the last peer, uh, the last, last element is the community engagement. So goal of that work stream is really to work with you, with our residents, our community, to develop a shared vision for an ideal future economy and start a dialogue on how Santa Monica can realize this vision. So what does this strategy look like? So at the end of this process, we will have a strategy that outlines a vision for the future of our economy. It includes, as strategies do, goals, objectives, uh, and action items um, to help us realize the vision. It will also include an operating model that defines how the city can work with its partners uh, in the private and nonprofit sectors to implement the plan and to help create change, meaningful change. And finally, we will develop key performance indicators that measure our progress and promote transparency and accountability. So I think this is really important because we all want to track how are we doing? What are we doing well? Where are there opportunities to rethink what, what's not working? Uh, we're gathering two types of input for the, for the strategy. So on the left side, um, you see that the, the technical expert insights. So we've been working with experts from academia, from civic groups, from think tanks, from private sector, to help to understand the impacts of the global trends and to design strategies that can help to capitalize on opportunities, mitigate the risks created by what Sean t just presented to us just a bit ago, um, risk created by AI, connectivity, and user options. But we also know it's an essential that we work with our community to design a strategy that reflects your priorities and what your vision is for the future and for Santa Monica. When taken together, these sources of input are helping to create a strategy that's both cutting edge as well as tailored to Santa Monica. This is a slide of, um, we had a deep dive event about a month and a half ago um, where we got together with our te technical experts to collaborate to, so we call it deconstruct the global trends and better understand their impact. Um, and it was looking at what are the trends on our economy, our workforce, the built environment, quality of life, government, the things that you guys just voted on in the last exercise. Um, during the session, the experts helped us to anticipate the risks and opportunities that are associated with AI, user options, and connectivity. These are f folks um, that are, have been thinking a lot about it, that are in the industry working to address solutions. So it's really helpful to get input from um, lots of different areas. Um, and also looking at helping us identify who are the winners and who are the losers, because I think that's really important to keep in mind. 
these are some of the outcome of um, the insights from the deep dive event. So we had the experts rank the risks and opportunities that they felt would be most important for Santa Monica and our region um, in the coming 30 years. And these are the results um, here. So I'll just pick out a couple of the top overall risks. Um, as we just talked about tonight, there's concerns about AI and what that means in terms of unemployment possibilities. Um, also just potentially woefully unprepared workforce, how our residents are going to be able to respond to the jobs of the future and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, on the positive side of opportunities, um, we're really looking at how, how AI user options uh, can really increase efficiencies, both in city services, um, but also in service delivery of, of what we have. And even things like smarter health, health management, creating new platforms to connect with one another and build stronger community. So parallel to our working with the experts, we're holding several events and activities, including the one tonight to gather community input. And you know, many of you are experts in this field too. Um, we're currently running a community survey. And so there were the forums outside um, and that many of you picked up. Um, it's also, we launched it at the State of the City event. It's online. Um, so it introduces the global trends, asks many of the same questions that we covered here tonight. Um, we would encourage you to please ask your friends and your neighbors who are not able to attend the evening this tonight um, to, to participate in the survey by visiting the Santa Monica 2050 website. And then in April, we're going to be holding a second, more interactive town hall um, where we'll be asking you all to help us to prioritize some of the proposed strategies. So tonight, we were here to present what we've learned so far. And then we want to come back to you to help to do a little more interactive in terms of what some of the strategies might look like. So the next event, um, and you're all on our mailing list, so we'll be sending it out to and putting it on our social media and doing with the local newspapers. But it will be uh, April 27th, and this one's going to be at Santa Monica College and their new um, auditorium in the Student Services Building. Um, and here we'll really be working with you to draft and prioritize strategies that will help to enhance our economic sustainability of the city. And we hope to see you there. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Anoush, who kicked us off, to um, do closing thoughts and remarks. All right, thanks everybody. Um, we are really grateful for um, your time, your attention, and above all, your input tonight. Um, as Jennifer said, um, we really want to invite you all and also anyone else that you think um, in your communities, in your neighborhoods, um, in your various you know, employers or um, networks that you think might be interested to please come back and stay connected to our April 27th event. That is gonna look very different than this one. Um, obviously, we're in kind of a theater style presentation room. We did do some interactive um, you know, texting tools. We have one more for you that's a lot of fun uh, coming up in a second. But this uh, next event is gonna be um, in a much more flexible space. It's gonna be, you're gonna be moving around, uh, you know, actually contributing ideas, ranking, doing dot exercises, um, using your post-it notes and your Sharpies and actually debating in your smaller groups some of the trends, some of the issues that we talked about today. And it really is the opportunity to dig in deeper if you did feel that something was missing or that we can contribute or, or take something in a different direction when we have some draft strategies to present to you all. That's a great opportunity for you to weigh in there. So just to kind of summarize um, what we all heard tonight, I think um, overall, you know, I think we're really gratified by the input, the feedback, um, the engagement that you all shared with us tonight. I think it helps us uh, feel like we're on the right track in terms of the types of trends and the impact areas that we are really studying through this effort. Um, you know, and, and um, so what I heard is, is that a lot of the same opportunities, um, a lot of the same things that we see as potential areas for growth in the future, um, to capitalize on ways to connect, ways to move around our city, um, ways to enhance health and well-being, are the same types of things that you all are thinking about. But then a lot of the concerns that we've identified are ones that you all share in terms of the impacts of dislocation, unemployment, or people's jobs being um, essentially automated out of existence, um, the risks, of course, to our climate, uh, to our connectedness, uh, to our social interactions due to technology, are the same types of things that um, you all are sort of hearing and feeling right now. 
certainly, um, you know, the focus that many of you had on climate change and the impacts uh, to our environment um, and kind of where you see or don't see that in, in the work that we presented to you this evening, um, I think is an opportunity for us to highlight, you know, many of you may be familiar with the Climate Action Adaptation Plan that our um, sustainability and the environment uh, team unveiled and, and the council adopted last year. And I think enhancing the connectivity, to use one of our words of the evening, between our effort and that effort to show that, you know, we do have um, obviously a very robust set of actions and goals and targets in that area and how that interplays with our economic future and our community's future um, is something that I think we can uh, continue to focus on going forward. So again, all of the input that you had today um, was super helpful um, as we move forward in, in kind of the home stretch of our strategy. I do want to invite you, um, this is a little bit of a different um, and fun exercise to, if you can, uh, pull out your phones one last time, open up that same texting window uh, for our last exercise. In this one, it's not a multiple choice, it's a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna ask you, get a little bit more creative, um, and if you can, uh, in that same texting thread, answer, um, ideally in one word, um, answer this question that you see on the screen. In an ideal world, what does Santa Monica look like in 2050? Um, so for this to work well, um, we're not looking for a sentence or a full thought or an essay. Um, we're, we're really look, looking, if possible, for one word or maybe a compound word, um, if, if you can. But think of a word, a state, a descriptor of, of what, if, if we get this right, if we do what we're all trying to do together, in 2050, what does Santa Monica look like? Um, what are the What's the community of our, of our successful and sustainable economic future, community's future, look like in 2050? So go ahead, and, and this one, I believe you can do multiple um, answers. You won't get, I'm not sure. The last time we did this, it, you were able to do multiple answers, and it's actually gonna generate um, a word cloud if you guys um, are able to populate your answers in, in that text field, um, and we'll start to see um, a visual representation of what you all are thinking about um, our hopefully successful future uh, 30 years from now. So go ahead and take a couple minutes um, to put in some answers. Um, I think you'll be able to do multiple in that text field. And we'll, uh, it'll be really useful for us to see um, what that vision is of, of the folks in this room. And obviously, continuing with the theme of what we um, many of you have shared tonight, we see big uh, in the middle is green, um, car free. Actually, looks like it's growing as well. Um, UBI, um, I think we've got some, some members of the Yang Gang in the house. Um, sustainability, capital, uh, vibrant, sustainable, friendly, some of the human uh, touches of what, the things that we've been talking about tonight, compassionate, um, diverse, um, you know, some of the ideas that we continue to, to think about and talk about. Um, it's just interesting to see this evolve. Green, green is growing. It's not always green somehow. Uh, but this is great. It's just uh, fascinating to see the thoughts um, of all of you in the room. Um, and we'll, you, you can continue to send them in and we'll capture this um, to help us. We've done this exercise now a couple of different times and it's just fascinating to see the ideas and the words um, that kind of rise to the surface when, when we do this. Clearly we're seeing some, some themes emerge here. Um, and I, I like the optimism in the room, which is good. So again, you know, just to wrap up, I want to thank you all for being here tonight and just invite you to stay engaged uh, with Santa Monica 2050. Well, once we're through with this, we'll have a slide up um, back on the screen that will show you um, our website, our email address and mailing list, um, how you can stay connected. Uh, please do um, stay in touch with us and, and stay in the loop. We have uh, an email update um, listserv that you can uh, join. Our webpage um, is on, it's um, santamonica.gov slash Economic future? Sorry, sandmarket.gov slash 2050 economy, 2050 economy. Um, we have our city blog where we'll be posting regular updates. Um, and then uh, again, uh, one more pitch for April 27th at Santa Monica College. We'll have an interactive, really dynamic um, community town hall. I think a couple of the folks in the room attended our um, deep dive and our uh, tech council events, which were similar in format. A lot of fun, really engaging. So please do uh, mark your calendar for that. Uh, but with that, thank you again. Uh, we appreciate your input and appreciate your participation. Thanks so much. Have a great night.